Hi everyone, welcome back. Monday, here we go again. Um, we've got a great week lined up and we're very much looking forward to seeing everyone. Um, I just wanted to say to you, um, go onto our website because um, the Cookbook Festival, because lots of people have put up um, fantastic recipes that go along with their, um, sorry, I um, that go along with their things um, by their names. They put forward any recipe they like. So if you really like someone, go onto the website, go to them, and there should be a recipe there. If it's not up, it's still in the process, but um, Lucy and Lucy have been working really, really hard to get them all up. Um, so that is great. And it's a great way to just see. And also, um, you can on our Instagram see any that you've missed. Um, we're slowly uploading them to YouTube. Things are changing, but they're changing quite slowly because Fran is not a technician at all this wizardry. So um, I'm having to learn and I'm not prepared to change until I know it works. <laughs> um, because that's me, <laughs> a little bit nervous. So tonight we've invited back um, Anna Headworth because I thought she was amazing um, and I just thought we didn't manage to capture it on our IGTV um, and it was too good a story to miss. So Anna, if you ask to join us, I've sent you an invite and then we can go live. Um, I don't know if you heard Anna or saw her story, um, but she, there we are. Um, well, you're going to hear, you're going to hear from her. Um, I'll try and steer her along the way. If you have any questions, just ask us and we can ask Anna. Um, but I think her food looks, hi Anna. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you? Very well. I think it's most probably a month since we last spoke, but oh. as I was just saying to everyone, I wanted to invite you back because we didn't get it on our IGTV. And I just think your story is too good to be missed. And, um, <laughs> You know, you're an amazing person for what you've gone through and what you're doing and where you are now. So let me introduce Anna. Anna Headworth um, of The Cookhouse Kitchen and the author of The Cookhouse Cookbook. Um, the cookery book won the um, Times Book of the Year in 2019 and the restaurant won the FT Restaurant of the Year. And Anna opens the restaurant in 2018, wrote the book in 2019, and has been serving many, many very, very happy people up in Newcastle upon time. Um, so welcome back, Anna. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, no, all is good, all is good. Right, I just want to go back to your backstory because this is what's come out of these talks. It's been very interesting. Some people are chefs all the way through and other people have had other careers and then their passion has said to them, I've got to stop. But Anna trained as an architect, which yeah. isn't a short training. She then worked for eight years as an architect, but still food was just niggling away in her and she wanted to do more. Tell us a bit more about that, Anna. Um, yeah, so I, tra I trained for seven years in Edinburgh um, doing architecture uh, and then I finished uh, my degree. I, I, I've always been interested in kind of des art, design, that kind of creative side of things. Um, and then I came back to Newcastle and I started working as an architect at a small um, firm in Newcastle. <clears throat> and and I, I enjoyed it um, because I enjoyed the kind of creative side of things. And when you're designing new projects and we were doing interesting things, people's houses, cinemas, bars, restaurants. Um, and I, I enjoyed that kind of uh, um, ideas and, and planning. But then actually when it came to how do you make this thing stand up and what, insula what level of insulation do you need to put in and, and all of those, it, I, I was just left like stone cold. <laughs> Um, the nuts and bolts of a building yeah, and trying to tell builders how to build something it was just that side of the job and the process as well just it, it's such a long process if, even small projects are years long and the kind of I guess the um the kind of start to end is just by the end by the end I was just so sick of them <laughs> like, even the interesting projects I was I was just so sick of them by the end um, but I didn't know what I 
I would do and said and so, so it was often something that went around in my head and I was like I don't how am I gonna find another job what what I need my paycheck what on earth am I gonna do but I was cooking all the time and I think I kind of didn't even realize that that was something I was so interested in it was just part of my life it's um, naturally there yeah and then it, it, it occurred to me as I, that I kind of developed that further and further and then I was inviting more and more people around to the house and cramming more and more people into the dining room people got bigger <laughs> yeah. um that maybe there was something in this and so I started tentatively doing a, having a food career on the side of an architecture career so I started with organizing some little local markets um, and then I progressed to uh, my first supper club which I'd been inspired by people I'd seen doing it in London at the time um, and decided to go for it and so I borrowed a shipping container which was um, a, a, a project I was involved with through architecture um, and hosted I put out a tweet saying does anyone want to come for dinner in a shipping container um, <laughs> and people did and so I that was the first supper club and 20 people who had who did had never heard of me and I'd never heard of them came oh really so they dinner. weren't your friends they were just I, I invited a couple of friends just to yeah. kind of feel better <laughs> yes yes <laughs> some reassurance um and they came for dinner. I, I did a thing that I'd um, read about in Berlin where I just gave people an envelope at the end and it was a pay what you feel um, thing because I didn't know who was I to say this is 40 pounds, no one, had, 30 pounds, whatever. No one had ever heard of me. Um, no one knew whether I could cook anything or not. So I didn't want to be presumptuous or maybe not the fear of not selling any tickets as well. Um, and so I gave everyone an envelope and they, they left enough money and sometimes more sometimes less and I continued to then do those supper clubs going forward alongside working as an architect kind of once a month once every couple of months yeah and you were breaking even or making money yeah a little bit so it kind of cost per head for the diner was probably I was probably spending about four pounds per head people generally left about 20 30 40 pounds so I was making a little bit of money um and then the National Trust approached me because um, they'd seen what I was doing and they asked if I would like to work with them on some locations in Northumberland. Um, and so we put together a series of dinners on I, on the Farn Islands, which is a little nature reserve just off the coast of um, Northumberland. And then we did some at Lindisfarne Castle as well, which is on itself on Holy Island. Um, they, they were just amazing, amazing. They would be spectacular. Yeah, total one-off. Um, you had to one of them. You had to go on a boat uh, to dinner, and it was in a 14th century chapel on an island with the whole island covered in nesting seabirds. It was just crazy, but amazing. And were you using all the local produce as much yeah. as possible? Yeah, yeah. And for that one on the island, that was particularly amazing because they had their own lobster net uh, pots, and so we just literally walked down to the sea and picked the got lobsters straight out of the sea, sea vegetables. Uh, it was, that was just one of the best things I've ever done. Gosh, what a treat. And did that start to give you more and more confidence? And then you thought, right, I'm really going to do this. This is giving me so much harmony in my heart. Yes, because it was, I guess, kind of getting the backing of someone like the National Trust, thinking that you're good enough and professional enough to work with was, yes, kind of a um, validation that yeah. I, maybe it maybe I could do something like this as a career um and yeah so just said well, I went to London actually um to yes. eat, uh, do some eating and while we were there I was like why don't I just open a restaurant in those shipping containers and suddenly that was kind of February and then I just came home and I left my job <laughs> And you also did um, like a week with two restaurants in London, didn't you? Was yeah. that before the supper club? That was, about, so... So that was just around the time that I left my job. So I went and worked in Quo Vardis uh, for a week and in Rochelle Canteen for a week. I guess to, because I actually, as much as I cooked and at that point, I hadn't actually worked in a professional kitchen. And mm. so I wanted that experience and to also to see, do I know what I'm doing? It, it, like, how the reality stupid, check. That's how stupid is this? But actually, it, 
it wasn't and it, they were they were so brilliant and welcoming and helpful and to see how that environment worked a, a lot I learned a lot about organization and how to because just the logistics not regardless of what's going on anyone's plate of yeah. how to actually kind of run a restaurant kitchen um it was it was brilliant terrifying I was so scared to actually go the first day but it was really brilliant Oh, that's fantastic. I just have to add that um, Jeremy Lee is coming on to talk with uh, uh -huh. Kitchen Conversations, which is fantastic. <laughs> so it's lovely that you went and worked there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's brilliant. Yeah, he, well, he seems very nice. So there yeah. we go. Um, but then you came back and so you asked if you could have the shipping containers on a permanent basis. Yeah, so I handed my notice in and also said, uh, I, don't, I don't want to do this anymore, uh, but can I... <laughs> rent the shipping containers and open them as a restaurant and my uh, old boss was very accommodating <laughs> and mm -hmm. I'd, so I'd saved up a little bit of money from mainly from the National Trust dinners um, I think I had six thousand pounds okay um, and so we kitted out the shipping containers with that it was kind of a lot of Ikea kitchen garden furniture painted it in lots of lovely different shades of blue planted herbs um, put lots of lovely lights up and it kind of it, it was a place that even as a shipping container had a it had a lovely atmosphere it was surrounded by trees and it's on a lo lovely little quiet street um and it always had lovely sunlight through it so I like was there anything like this in Newcastle at all or were you the first no not at that point I think I was the first there's okay. Riley, uh, Riley's Fish Shack which is quite famous that's down on the beach they were I think a year after me um, and then there were, there were various others, but yes, I think I was the first. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, I just started one kind of task at a time and, um, and, got, and got there in the end and then opened, uh, it, I left my job in the, in the May of that year, that was 2014, and then it opened up in the August. Um, yeah. And you were serving, what, breakfast, lunch and dinner or just two of them? Just breakfast and lunch at that stage because I actually started it entirely on my own. Um, so that initial first year, it was just me doing everything. Um, so I did breakfast and lunch um, and just a small chalkboard menu every day of kind of local produce. And it was potted meats and pâtés and salads and uh, gratins, things like that. Manageable uh, things on your yes. own. <laughs> things that I knew I could make and then they would be ready. And then when people came, I was then serving. So it was practical oh. in that sense <laughs> and how many covers were you doing roughly then i think we had about 18 to 20 seats inside and then in the summer it had a little garden at the back and a little garden at the front that you could put more um tables and chairs out and then as it grew in popularity um i did eventually employ someone else but then it was just still just the two of us for quite a long time really and did you have a license then or was it just operating no it was it was just bringing your own at that point Okay. Um, and I would do a monthly, so just daytime service, but then do a monthly or fortnightly dinner where it was just a long table dinner and then strangers would come and all sit together and there would just be one set kind of seasonal. Um, yeah. And where we just laid food all down the middle of the table and people kind of dug in and looked at their neighbours apprehensively, but then kind of were friends by the end of the night. Yeah, which is a lovely thing to do, I have to say, because it's that communal table that brings everyone together. Yeah. The food's good and it's sharing platters, I guess, or was it all plated? Yeah, yeah, lots of it was sharing. Um, yeah. And you could you could see people arriving, say, a husband who hadn't been told by his wife that it was going to be a communal table and looking in horror. <laughs> and then... By Relax, the end, you yeah. used to look at him and say. Yeah. And then by the end, they'd be going to the pub afterwards together with the people that they'd sat next to. It was lovely. It was seeing you created a real community and were able to give them your food. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's lovely. And they were two shipping containers, weren't they? Yes, two two stuck together with the middle cut out. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. But then you thought, no, this isn't enough. <laughs> yeah, so I, I always had kind of this pipe dream that I would, would open something more of a proper restaurant because um, <laughs> it was quite unusual. People never knew what to call it. Um, but... I, I, I didn't know where or how or when and kind of used to look around. But then we got the word that our street was going to be redeveloped and uh, the building site was going to start right opposite 
um, the containers, which it was already on a quiet street, a little bit out of the way with no parking. And I just thought if people have to trek along this road in the mud um, to get to me, they, you know, we're drilling and it's just going to be horrific. So I, I decided at that point that I needed to seriously look to move. Um, and my other half is, is still an architect. He actually enjoys it and is good at it. Um, but... <laughs> Um, one of his clients actually said to him, he owned a building nearby and he said, oh, it's just been up empty for a year. Um, I think I might um, strip it out, tidy it up a bit and let it out to someone as a cafe or a restaurant or something like that. And so he was like, he was like hang on, I think I think I might know someone. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was much bigger than I planned. It's, it's, it's pretty big. And we moved in there in 2000, December 2018 and it was obviously a lot more money than I had or knew where to get hold of. Um, so we came up with the idea of doing a crowdfunder, um, which I toyed with the idea for quite a long time because it felt like, who am I to just ask people to give me their money? Why should, why should they? Um, I'm not a charity. It, it, it was awkward. But then we came up with the idea that, as Gary Usher has famously done numerous times in Manchester basically selling someone their dinner in advance yeah. and so we sold dinners classes um various things that people would be able to come to this future restaurant and have when we opened and it was really um really successful it we hit our target I think we put a month timeline on it and after 12 days I think Yes, you went boom straight away. You had obviously created a really good community in Newcastle. Yes. And you had a following. I think I said that to you last time. It it, um, it really was so heartwarming to realise. I, I obviously, I knew I had nice customers. I had to talk to them every day and um, they they were lovely people. But I didn't, I didn't have any idea how many people felt invested in the place and how many people wanted to see me do well, which was really just very very heartwarming yeah it must have given you a brilliant boost in confidence if ever you had a little wobble or anything yes yes totally yeah, yeah. to 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 get your crowdfunding and sort of give it a month and then sort of exceed it within 12 days yeah, is I just know. incredible Crazy. yeah did you then feel like you had a weight on your shoulders because i know where all these people i've got to open and i've got to give them their meals and give them experiences and kitchen yeah it's, it's it was um yes and no it that it was a comfort actually knowing that those people were going to come and so yes. um, so some people some people were definitely signed up to come along yeah. Um, yeah and then it was it was very nervy because it wasn't actually we didn't actually raise enough money because it was loads more expensive than what we um, As building and then, <laughs> and then things went wrong and builders disappeared and it flooded at one point and um, but um, then we it, we were opening, we were going to open in the summer, then in the autumn, and then it, we, we ended up opening a few days, about a week before Christmas, and it was absolutely chaotic. We didn't have windows a week before we opened. I spent a lot of time just trying to stop builders leaving sites. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are opening, I'm opening a business, you're not leaving, come you back. You not go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. And um, were you very particular on the interior? You, because I, I understand it's like a community. It's got a sort of garden. It's got a workshop. It's got um, the kitchen. You can see the kitchen from the yeah, restaurant. The, kitchen, the kitchen's all open, and we've got a little kind of um, workshop kitchens that people can see into. We've got a, a little garden where we grow herbs and flowers and things that we we use in the menu. Um, yes, I, I'm quite particular about. <laughs> what things look like um and so yes we did it all ourselves um with my other half he he took the lead on it um yeah. but did um, you have to compromise on what you spent like you would have liked this but you had to find alternatives to make yeah it work. very much very much so and then things at the beginning that were just crucial and had to spend a lot of money on like extract which costs a fortune um and then by the end it was like oh i was going to get a ceramicist to make me my own set of plates well no they're from habitat and they were reduced in a sale but <laughs> um, but things yeah. like everything looks beautiful even though we had to compromise here and there and we didn't we didn't I, I guess we we always knew we weren't opening as a finished product we were we were opening 
I, I see it as a project that is an ongoing thing. And so as we go along the line, we've, we've added things. We added more to the garden. We added the terrace outside. We've got a big <clears throat> terrace overlooking the valley. Um, and at the moment, I'm working on um, increasing our web our website so people can buy um, things from our shop online, which you couldn't before. So I guess it's just always... It's like a growing new, thing continually. I like, I like new projects. So yeah. Okay, so you're inquisitive <laughs> and trying to grow your brand all the time, but in a yeah. good organic way. Yeah. And how many people can you seat now in your new place? Um, well, capacity is about 60, and then we've probably got 20, 30 seats on the terrace. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lovely. I'd... And you, you said to me last time that on a Saturday night, how many can you do? On a Saturday night, we'll do like a hundred, and then probably a hundred during the day, maybe more. Yeah. Um, it's it, it was it's really been incredibly busy. Um, we didn't have any idea. I just didn't know what to expect. Um, and when when we opened, it seems like a dream now. It was so crazy, and we just didn't have enough staff, and everybody was working every single hour going, and there were frequent tears. <laughs> And everyone was very, very thin because we didn't find time to eat. Um, but it was it was lovely. The, the team are just a bunch of really lovely, enthusiastic people. So. And how many staff do you have? I think there's 15 of us now. Okay, yeah. So you're obviously working hard, though. If you're doing 250, say, on a Saturday. Yeah. Um, that, that's hard work. Quite intense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but you obviously like it that way. Yeah. You obviously... You like to be busy and some yes. people do. I like to be busy. I like to have plans and Absolutely. things going on. I'm finding it so difficult at the minute because I, I don't have any deadlines or pressures. And so actually getting things done in this environment is, is really difficult. But whereas when you're busy, you can get so much yeah. done. Yeah. And tell me, so you're obviously shut now. Yeah. And have you got any plans to open with sort of space because you've got space or yeah. your, your well, boxes? We're pretty spacious, so that's good. Um, next week, we are reopening our shop. Um, okay. So we've got a little shop where we sell all of the stuff that we use in-house. So it's a nice where, place that people can buy local produce um, that you can't get in lots of other places. So see, like working with grow, local vegetable growers, oh, um, bak bakers, organic milk, but uh, uh, just lovely, lovely stuff. So, so that's exciting that we're reopening all of that. Um, next week and i've been working on increasing um our own offer so that will have more of our own like deli products and sauces and marinades and um things like that um and we're also going to do a bit of takeout because the weather's been so nice and it's just where the restaurant is it's a beautiful little spot with a river running through and benches so we're hoping that people will come and You'll do a coffee it. and you'll do bakery yeah. and sandwiches or soup or stuff to picnic outside. Yeah. Um, we're going to put the barbecue on, so that'll be fun. Oh, um, great. And oh, then I'm really I'm happy to hear that for you. That's fantastic news. Yes, it'll be so nice to have something to do. Um, <laughs> um, and then we're hearing rumours that we might be able to open the restaurant sometime after the 4th of July at a, at a spaced out um, capacity, but it, I think we'll go with whatever we're allowed to do okay yeah it's, it's all a bit uncertain at the moment isn't it yeah and there's not much information floating but around but we'll yeah we'll yeah and some people are doing things and some people aren't and there's a whole variety of things going on yeah um, but i wish you the very best of luck now i saw that you make your own kombucha i'm a bit oh, of a yes. kombucha freak are you ah oh, right <laughs> Yes, Yours absolutely. looked fantastic. I think mine might have gone a slightly wrong because I had too much, so I had to put my um, scoby in the fridge. And uh, I don't think it's waking up very well. I think it can take a while. Can it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I've been making it for... Um, maybe the scoby is like four or five years old. Um, we In the restaurant, we make all of our own soft drinks, so we don't have anything bought in at all. We do... Um, our own kombuchas, our own shrubs, um, cordials. We've even made our own tonic water. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in that kind of botanical side of, mm. of things and, and the drinks. And I, I love I love kombucha. Wow. And I, I love the way you can flavour it with all sorts of different yeah. things. Yeah. And it's almost a bit like making bread, making sourdough. Once you get into the rhythm, 
it works. Yes. But it's yeah. the unknown before you get that first, yeah, it first like glass. Some, it's some kind of, it looks like some kind of weird experiment. We've got it in the, in the window of our prep kitchen and people are always peering at it being like, what is that? <laughs> it, looks it looks like, like sort like, of Frankenstein's yeah, kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, what are your shrubs? Um, so it's kind of, it's a drinking vinegar. Um, so in historically they would make instead of I suppose in, instead of lemon juice they would or, or preserve things in citrus they would use vinegar so seasonal fruits would be you steep them in in vinegar um, for a couple of weeks depending on what the fruit is um, and then we just sweeten that up a little bit um, and then serve that with soda um, and ice and so they're just really refreshing um, right soft drinks that are all kind of with natural fruits and um, herbs that we that make. That sounds delicious and because of the vinegar it makes me think they might be a little bit like kombucha. A little bit yeah they're, they're not dissimilar not dissimilar flavours a bit more like um, they're a, probably a bit more of classic um, kind of soda um, taste. Um, people yeah, it's, it's a hard sell sometimes when you like when people ask what's that to like it's vinegar. <laughs> Yeah, but lots of people drink a, a couple of spoonfuls of apple cider vinegar yeah. every day for their well-being. So does yeah. this have beneficiary well-being? Um, yeah, I think it's good it's in the whole kind of gut health realm. I think, yeah. I think that it's pretty good for you. Okay. Um, I just made a lovely one with fresh peaches and cherry and blackcurrant leaves, um, which, which smells delicious, but I'm still waiting for it to be ready. Yeah. Have you made some elderflower? Yes, I went and picked elderflower at the weekend actually, um, and we've done. We're going to do a shrub with that, and then we stuck some in some gin, um, and then yeah. I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting our cocktail menu back up and running as well. <laughs> yeah, and do you make all your own breads there? Or... No, we've got. Um, that's our, the only thing that we don't make. We, we've got a, a local guy, um, Robbie, who makes our bread for us, and it's it's amazing. Um, so yeah, yeah, really delicious. But your menu changes all the time according to the produce you get, what yes. you fancy cooking, the season it is, what's going yes. well. It changes very frequently. So just whatever, um, we work very closely with local suppliers. So whatever they show up with, sometimes we don't even know what they're, they're gonna bring. Um, and then we, we can just change, we just print it ourselves just before each service so it can it can literally change five minutes before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before and with we... your suppliers, do you say to them, just bring me the best of what you've got? Or do you say, no, I want broccoli, I want... Pizza. No, I, I'm more guided by them. So I'll, I'll ask people what, what they think is the best stuff they've got at the minute and then we'll go with, we'll go with that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I work, I've always worked pretty seasonally. Um, it's nice because thing, then things change and you never get bored of anything. And you're yeah. excited because there's yes. a box of something you haven't had for a while. Yeah, exactly. And someone's just shown up and it's all very exciting rather than cooking the same thing that you've been cooking for weeks and you've tired yeah. off. Yeah. Tell me though, just saying that, what's a classic breakfast dish that's sort of, you can't take it off the menu, um, um, that just works? We've got, um, that, that people are a bit obsessed with, a baked eggs dish. And it, it's curried leek um cream baked eggs and then smoked mackerel or haddock so it's a bit kind of um kedgeri cull and skinky um, oh. and the cream kind of uh, bubbles away with all of the leeks and the curry and it's really that's that's pretty so it's like a gratin dish almost yeah, and yeah. made individually yes oh, um, I and then like the sound of that we do a whipped feta which is pretty i've always done that since the beginning which is pretty popular and for breakfast we serve that on toast um, with slices of poached pear and walnuts and honey, which is really, that's a really, that's a good one. That sounds nice. And <laughs> tell me something off your lunchtime menu that's a bit of a, a just a goodie. And um, I it. suppose one, one of the most famous ones is our chicken salad, which we, we do, um, I don't know if you've seen the roast chicken that we do on our Sunday menu is, it was stuff it with herbs and creme fraiche. Um, but for, for the lunch um, day to day menu, we'll shred up that roast chicken. Um, and make it into a salad with all of the juices and then toss that through a salad with kind of ribbons of courgette and we make um, a sourdough crumb with our leftover bread um, and then a good punchy aioli on the side as well. So that's so it's your sort of take on a Caesar salad, but it's yeah. a salad. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say that Anna's special chicken is that between the skin and the flesh of the chicken, you can thread your hands underneath it and you stuff it with creme fraiche and favourite herbs and season, don't you? Yeah. And then yeah. roast it. So then it's all unctuous as it's cooking. Yeah. And then you carve it and all of the creme fraiche melts into the meat. It's, it, it's really lovely. Yeah, have a go at home, anyone. If you, and you can also do it. Okay, you might disagree with this, but you can do it with Philadelphia. You can do it with all sorts, anything that's soft, can't you? That you can't get. Yeah, fresh. yeah, or just loads of butter if you fancy that as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> goat's cheese that's yes, soft. Yes. It works really well, and just mix up your favourite. You can put chilies in it. You can put sage in it. Just whatever works oh, for yeah. your family. <laughs> Um, we generally do it with herbs and uh, it's really good with lovage if you can get hold of some lovage from anyone. Um, but we did do it once with um, our butcher makes their own andouille um, and we put that through the creme fraiche. So it was really like hot and spicy, but with the cream, creamy creme fraiche and when that all melted together, that was, that was really good. <laughs> yeah. Someone's just asked, is that recipe in your book? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's, now let's talk about your most... award winning book because while you were opening up this restaurant and running around and getting very thin, yes, here we have it, the Cookhouse <laughs> Kitchen. Um, and you won the FT, no, the, the Sunday Times Best Cookbook, didn't you? It was, yes, I, well, I was in, the, it was a top nine, um, so I was one of nine. Um, but that was their, their books of the year, which was just uh, mind-blowing, to be honest. Did you um, know about this in advance, or did you just find out? No, no I just found out. And then I started crying. <laughs> um, same, same with the FT. I had no idea about the FT. I knew that um, Tim Hayward had been for lunch um, because I'd, I'd met him. Um, and he just quietly had a little lunch on his own and then gone on his way. Um, and he'd Those are always the ones. <laughs> yeah. He'd, um, he mentioned that he was here to review another restaurant in Newcastle, Trackle. And he'd given them an amazing review. And then he'd given us a tiny little mention at the end of it saying yeah oh i had a lovely i had a lovely lunch as well at cookhouse uh, and then this article came out in december where he noted everywhere that he'd been in the whole country over the course of the year but that his favorite place that he'd been to was actually us which was just and then he compared me to alice waters which was also made me cry <laughs> oh that's lovely well i think you do have a passion someone's asking the name of your book it's called the cookhouse kitchen and you can get it um, online. There we are. Yeah, it's, what... it's available Amazon, Waterstones, everywhere. Yeah. Um, I think it's on sale on Amazon at the minute, but. Quick, go shopping everyone and buy that book. <laughs> it's a goodie. No, I, I, actually you saying Alice Walters, I can, I can hear that actually in the way you talk because you are so passionate about your produce. Well, she's um, a massively she's inspirational in... figure as well. And I guess I, I, I kind of look to her a little bit because she's just one of those women who she's made it up her own way. She's just done her own thing. She never followed any rules. She just opened a restaurant that she wanted to go to. And so I think I've, I've got similar um, feelings about how I've gone on my journey as to she's obviously like massively successful. But, you know, <laughs> I think you're in on the, the way to doing very well, though, because um <laughs> You, you've got some lovely reviews and um, you, you, you don't seem to have done anything wrong, is what I will say. And your food does look delicious. And I now have a reason to go to Newcastle. There's been many ah, reasons yeah. before, yeah. but I'm going to come and see you. Good. And I'm going to have a drink with you, definitely. <laughs> um, just tell me, if you could have a last meal, what would that be? Um, I know that's a bit of a skew F one, but it's just nice to hear because we're hearing you make up a recipe, a menu in front of us. Um, so, well, I have thought about this before, I think. Uh, my favourite, my absolute favourite foods would be, um, I think I'd have to start with some langoustine, poached um, cold langoustine with some aioli, maybe some oysters on the side. Um, and then one of my favourite things... Um, black pudding, duck, maybe some woodcock. That's a bit <laughs> off the wall, but it's one of my favourites. Yeah. And how um, do you and put those together? Yeah, maybe some truffles. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'm not really bothered about pudding, um, but I would have a lot of cheese. Um, okay. There's a, there's a uh, cheese maker in, the, in Northumberland called Doddington, 
um, and they make a cheese called Darling Blue, which is just one of the most delicious, like biscuity, nutty blue cheeses. It's I love it. Is it hard or soft? It's kind of somewhere in between. It's not like any other blue cheese I've ever had. Oh, um, and is it new? Soft. How long have they been making no, it? For? It's been around for a while now. Um, they're they're very good cheese makers. Um, that their their classic one, which is called Doddington, as well, is kind of like a nutty. Um, Manchego type, which is it's really delicious as well. You um, know what, British cheeses are amazing. I think you can order them from Neil's Yard, actually. Okay, because they sell just British cheeses, don't yeah. they? Yeah. The British cheese market has just gone insane in the last 10 years. Yes, it's, it's, it's nice to see. And then I think there was a lot of publicity with people not being able to sell their cheeses recently. And that's actually alerted people to um, the fact that they should be supporting these amazing cheese yes yes well we've actually got a cheese maker coming on in a few weeks because i've been wanting to talk about that to help support the british cheese makers mm -hmm. um any anyone who's a, a producer needs to be supported so you opening up your shop will ho help your producers again yes hopefully i think touchwood all of them seem to have been quite creative in this time and all seem to have, have managed and diversified um but it's it's nice to be able to offer it all to the general public as well yeah yeah definitely do you have a favorite kitchen tool it, it i'm going to choose a spatula okay <laughs> no i love it when they're just simple <laughs> because it's it's not about sort of big gizmos it's about something that works my favorite spatula yeah <laughs> and is it one in particular that you've always had or yeah is it any spatula no no it's a particular one wooden yeah. handle <laughs> oh, okay. It's a silicon spatula. I yeah, love those. I love them. Anyone who's a good chef has a silicon spatula because you never leave anything in the bowl. And when yes, you're running a business, you can't waste behind. anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you employ someone new, I bet you look at how well they scrape the bowl out and you sort of go, you left 5% of that mix in there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Okay. And um, I know your inspirations are um, strong, successful women. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so people like, well, Elizabeth David, I've always read her. I've always loved reading um, food literature as well as buying an awful lot of cookery books. Um, so yeah, Elizabeth David. Um, Margot Henderson from Rochelle Canteen was a huge inspiration. Um, I, I, as well as going to work there, she I think she's just a, a little bit like Alice Waters, I guess. She just kind of made up her own way of doing things and um it has been hugely successful um I, Tom, someone like thomasina myers as well i met um and she like i don't think people even recognize how much interesting stuff she does in the food world um it does uh, for a lot yeah yeah um so yes people like that people strong women who do their own thing <laughs> strong women and if you had a favorite ingredient like uh, a spice, like that, not a whole, not a meat, but a spice or something. Is there some sort of spice that you constantly sort of keep grabbing? Like um, black pepper would be for me. Yeah, I couldn't I, live without black pepper, <laughs> freshly ground. Um, my favourite at the minute, actually, which I've been cooking with quite a lot, is star anise, which I didn't used to really like too much because of past experiences with Sambuca. Um, but <laughs> um, but I... I absolutely love it now and i recently cooked some ox cheeks and put some star anise in and then the the delicacy of the flavor kind of going into strong meats uh, was is really with kind of ginger and orange and things like that was really i've been using it quite a lot that sounds lovely i like the idea of that just adding a bit of warmth to something yes yeah. Like yeah yeah just that little bit of warmth well listen this has been absolutely fantastic what are you cooking for supper tonight um, well, I've got leftovers, but it's um, I cooked at the weekend. I cooked um, rabbits, which I haven't cooked for a while. Um, in it was in cream and cider and herbs and capers. Um, but I'm going to make the leftovers into a pasta sauce. Oh, lovely! So a ragu sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So like a creamy rabbit ragu. And will you make your own pasta, or have you got some in the cupboard? I've got some in the cupboard, but I have been making it over lockdown, which yeah. actually was very, very enjoyable process. Just very relaxing. It's very therapeutic doing yeah. something like that, isn't it? Yes. 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 Yeah. 
And um, I saw you've been making some bagels and having fun with those. Yes, yes. That oh, the the rest. I've got a bagel recipe in my book, but the um, the difference between a homemade bagel and a shop bagel is just worlds apart. They're just they're so good. I encourage anyone to give give it a go. It's kind of like yeah. a day long project, but it's it's nice. It's a project, but it's good with a good result and something that okay. you've never tasted before. I agree with you. And it's also fascinating to know the journey that goes into making them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not I, straightforward. No, the first time I ever make them, I was like, what, you poach them? How, what? But, poach yeah. bread? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, listen, we wish you the very, very best of luck with um, opening up next week. And um, someone Thank wrote you. in and said they've already book ordered your book and they can't oh, wait for it to arrive to get cooking oh, out of it. So that's great. Um, and Lucy, I know, um, on the Cookbook Festival has your book and she's loving it, absolutely loving it. So, it's been lovely to see so many people cooking from it over lockdown. I've been sent hundreds of pictures. It's, it's really nice. Oh, that's lovely. Well, yeah. all the very best, Anna. And um, we'll all come and see you. We go to the Cookhouse Kitchen when we're up in Newcastle and we have some shrub and some <laughs> delicious eggs and some kombucha. And maybe we'll have a drink of gin as well. Yeah, let's. <laughs> okay. Take care. Okay, nice, nice to see, to see you. you. Bye-bye.